Hello and welcome to our online service for St. Clements Nayland and St. Tidwell's and Stadwell. Great that you could join us. Um, I'm actually in St. Clements Church. It's uh, a little bit windy and possibly raining outside. In fact, you might hear thunder uh, depending on what happens. You can see the church hasn't been used for a bit. There's still the purple in front of the altar table there, left over, I guess, from Lent. Now, you might have heard that churches can open again. Welsh Government have allowed that from Monday. In actual fact, it's not going to happen any time immediately, either of these two churches, because it's going to take a while to get ready, and we have to follow very strict guidelines from both government and church in order to keep people safe. We're continuing today our series from the beginning of Acts on ordinary people. Peter and John were hauled up, uh, that's the apostles, hauled up before the Jewish leaders. And after a little bit of an interrogation, the leaders judged Peter and John to be unschooled, ordinary men. And yet through those ordinary people, God was able to do extraordinary things. And so surely he can do through us today. So a moment's quiet, and then a verse of scripture, and an opening prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are here in the presence of the living God with the whole company of heaven to offer him our worship through Jesus Christ our Lord and to know more truly the greatness of his love. We have come to hear and receive his word to seek the strength of the Holy Spirit, that our lives may bear the fruit of his grace, and to pray for the world, for the church, and for those who are in need. But first let us bring before God an awareness of our sin, the times we have fallen short of his standard of love, the way in which our heart is far from undivided in its loyalty. Let us confess our sins to the Father and seek his pardon and peace. Almighty and merciful God, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, we have not loved you with all our heart, and we have not loved others as Christ loves us. We are truly sorry. In your mercy, forgive us. Help us to amend our lives, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. May God, our Father, who by our Lord Jesus Christ has reconciled the world to himself and forgives the sins of all who truly repent, pardon and deliver us from all our sins and grant us the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The reading is from Psalm 86, verses 4 to 13. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. 
no deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvellous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name for ever. For great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. What wonderful deeds has God done for you? How much are you aware of God's great love? Well, thank you, Philip, for reading that. Our preacher in a few minutes is Bob Kappa. He retired to Nayland a few years ago with his wife, Roz. And I've just asked him to say a little bit about what he was doing before that and what brought him to Nayland and perhaps what from that psalm we've just heard has resonated in his life. And after that, we're going to have our first hymn. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. They're fantastic words from that psalm we've just read together. And... Um, we found God to be faithful in so many situations. Uh, before we came to Nayland, I was a vicar for 40 years. And um, most recently, Ros and I were in Cardiff for the last uh, 16 and a half or so years before we came here. Previous to that, we'd been in, uh, in Newport, in Malpas, before that, Aberystwyth, before that, another part of Newport. And um, being a vicar is, is a great job, it's the best job in the world, terrific variety. But of course, it wasn't always easy. But we always found God to be faithful. Another verse which is really good um, is, and I'd like you to think about this, is the one which says, verse 12, I will glorify your name forever. And when we go on to think about the Acts passage after the song, when we've heard from Acts, we're going to be hearing a lot about the name of God, or specifically the name of Jesus, and uh, the power that there is in the name of Jesus. So let's glorify God's name together.
Acts 4, verses 1 to 21, Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caphias, John, Alexander and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled or ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have been formed and noted the sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them, because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Thank you, Andrew and Amy, for that, for that reading. Let's pray together. Bless us now, Lord, as we think about the meaning of that passage. May your Holy Spirit, who inspired it, apply it to our hearts and lives today. Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. Our theme today is uh, Prisoners. Or maybe you should call it Prisoner's Pulpit. If you were with us last week, we heard about the layman at the temple gate being 
totally healed through Peter's ministry. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. The ripples from that almighty splash are still going out. Peter and John get arrested. Why? Because the Sadducees especially are greatly annoyed. Because Peter and John, we're told in verse 2, were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now the Sadducees uh, didn't believe in resurrection at all for anyone. I think we probably know a lot of people like that today. Their future hope only meant God's people carrying on into the future here on earth, descendants passing on to descendants and, and so on. They would have arguments with the Pharisees who did believe in a future resurrection. Maybe sometimes they would agree to differ. But this was different. Peter and John were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You see, instead of theories about the future, they were talking about something that had actually happened in the past. A reality of history. Not, we believe people will rise, but we know someone has risen. And that person is the man Jesus. For people to start believing that kind of thing was bad news for Sadducees. Can we stop here for a moment? What does it mean to share our Christian faith in Jesus? I believe it means if you can only say one thing about what you believe, say, I believe or I know Jesus rose from death on Easter Day. Either he did or he didn't. If he did, it must make a difference. We believe he did. If he did, you've got to believe in the resurrection, in life after death, the stumbling block for the Sadducees. If he did, you've got to believe Jesus is who he said he was. No other choices. The Pharisees, the Sadducees rather, didn't like that, so they have him arrested. But they can't stop the message. But many of those who heard the word believed, we're told in verse 4, and the number of men, i.e. we have to double or treble this for the full number, was about 5,000. So they're arrested and the next day the elders and scribes gather. This all sounds very familiar. So like the beginning of Jesus' own trial back at Easter time. It also happened in Jerusalem. Some of the people of the same, Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and other members of the high priestly family. Maybe we remember Jesus said that what happened to him would happen to his disciples too. He suffered, they might need to suffer. Now notice, they can't deny what's happened, the miracle of the lame man's healing, but they ask, in verse 7, by what power or by what name did you do this? I wonder if Peter remembered at that moment the other time he had been at or near a kangaroo trial at the high priest's house. These same ones, these same people. He was asked, do you remember, surely you were with Jesus? And he said, I don't know the man. But now Peter, when he's asked by what power or by what name did you do this? We read, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, here's the difference, not just Peter now, but Peter plus the Holy Spirit. That means Peter plus 
God because the Holy Spirit is God. Not just a force, but God himself. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. By what name? By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Crystal clear. But there's more to come. Whom you crucified. No pussyfooting now. They personally have put him to death. There comes a moment when the gospel always calls people to understand they've got things wrong and need to admit it. I've got things wrong. You've got things wrong. Now, no one else is like these people who plotted and demanded his death that first Monday, Thursday night and Good Friday morning. But the Gospel teaches us that each of us is in a sense responsible for Jesus' death. Because it wasn't for because if it wasn't for our sins, human sins, my sins, your sins, he would not have needed to die. This Jesus whom you crucified. But Peter continues, whom God raised from the dead. God reversed the impact. Jesus rose. God reversed the verdict. He really was who he said he was, Messiah and Son of God. That's the implication. And now Jesus is alive. He's continuing to do his works of power. By him, this man is standing before you well. Here is your evidence. It's great when we can say that, isn't it? Now Peter turns the screw, as it were, citing one of their Jewish scriptures, Psalm 118 verse 22, a, a verse that Jesus had taught him was to be applied to Jesus himself. You can find that in Matthew 21, 42. Jesus even gives us the words sometimes. This is what he said. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. A picture from architecture, from a building. I've got a, a stone, uh, a brick here, which I guess if it was the first brick down, would be a bit like the, the cornerstone of a building. It has to be lined up properly. Well, that's the stone God, the builder, chose. This Jesus. It's a warning, isn't it? Take heed of the scriptures, what God said long ago. No good having your scroll in the synagogue or temple or your Bible on the shelf. And so to Peter's resounding conclusion from the prisoner's pulpit. Verse 12, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now that's a verse worth learning, a verse to read again and again. This is what the Apostles Peter and John taught and we have no authority to change it. I say that because it goes completely against what most people today would hold. We're taught to think one faith or none is as good as another. Sincerity is, ma is what matters, not what we actually believe. There are many roads to God, to heaven. Jesus is just one of those. Well, listen to Peter again. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. What a claim. What is it based on? 
How can Peter say that? Very simply, no one else speaks with the authority of one who has come back from death, has overcome death, except for Jesus. Remember, it wasn't just a temporary resuscitation like uh, some of the miracles in the Gospels. Lazarus, he was brought back to wife or the son of the widow of Nain or the daughter of Jairus. They, they would have died again. But for Jesus, death is now past. Resurrection life is flowing out into the present. Brothers and sisters, we are Easter people. And yes, let's use that word that Peter used. We are saved people. There is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. Are you saved? Let's be able to say, yes, I am. Jesus has saved me. And don't be ashamed of that. We haven't time to go through all the rest of the story in detail. The authorities are truly gobsmacked. These people aren't educated. They're so bold. They recognised that they had been with Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if our neighbours, our family, could say the same about us? The hands of the authorities are tied because he, there's the man. Too many already know of his healing. What do they do? Well, they think, let's try a lockdown. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, verse 17, stop this thing from spreading, we must warn them not to speak, do it? No, to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called Peter and John in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Isn't that so relevant to today? Let's stop it spreading. The bad infection. We say that about COVID-19. People were saying, let's stop it spreading. What we know to be the good infection of Jesus. Don't speak any more to anyone in this name. Would anyone need to say something like that to us? Let's make sure we use our freedom this week to speak to someone. I'm worried, but I can't be too worried because my Jesus has overcome death and all its powers, including COVID. I know God does care about what's happening because he sent Jesus to our suffering world, his own son, suffered right through to a cruel and painful death, but rose again and is alive now. Or, yes, it is lonely without my family, but as a Christian, I know I am not really alone because Jesus is with me every day and I can talk to him and know his presence. Verse 20, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Can we be like that? Can we feel that? Can we be bold like Peter and John? We can't. God can. And we have God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name. Amen. Uh, thanks to Bob for that. Our worship song now is sung by Colleen with Eric on the piano and it's followed by uh, a video from Claire Hewitt who is head teacher at Nayland School and she's just describing some of the problems and, and the things they've had to get to grips with before the children go back to school on Monday week and that's going to be helpful for us to know and for us to be able to pray better.
But let's use this song now to think and pray through what we've heard from Bob and God's word and to consider the person of Jesus and what he means to us. Jesus, what a wonderful name. Jesus, what a beautiful name, Son of God, Son of Man, Lamb that was slain, joy and peace, strength and hope, grace that blows all fear away, Jesus, what a beautiful Can I just say, uh, for thinking of us um, at this difficult time that we've been having um, here at, at school for our, for our whole school community, really. Um, here I am sat in my office, not like um, my office normally is, not like school normally is. Um, and just wanted to share perhaps with you some of the challenges and the difficulties that we are facing um, as, as a community here, really. Um, it's it's been really difficult it's been very difficult to respond quickly to all the changes that are going ahead um having the courage and the self-belief really that um, at times we're having to make quick decisions and hoping that we make the right ones the right ones for for our children and um for for us all really um uh to ensure our safety and, and health and well-being we are preparing at the moment for opening, um, which is really exciting. Um, we're looking forward to seeing those children again and, and being back together again. Um, but again, that comes with its challenges, comes with its concerns and worries. As practitioners, we, if a child falls over, um, we instantly go and pick them up. If a child is struggling um, with their work, we instantly go and sit next to them, kneel beside them and support them. All those things are changing and that goes very um, against what we do and what we believe. And that's going to be um, very difficult for, for us, but equally we've got to think very carefully of the children's well-being. Um, we want them to come back to school feeling safe and secure. Um, and, you know, they, they've been out of the building for a very long time. And that's difficult. It's difficult for them to walk back through those doors for some of them um, and to feel um, to feel that, that, you know, everything is still the same and, and it's not going to be. It's going to be incredibly different, um, incredibly different. And we have to manage that very, very carefully for, for their emotional well-being um, and for ours too. So, yeah, it has been a difficult time, um, but what has come through is is the teamwork, the um, coming together as a community um, and being with each other, albeit very uh, virtually. So 
I think all our IT skills have gone through the roof compared to what they were before um, and we found a new way to connect and to be with our learners and our families. So I do appreciate you thinking of us at this time and, and it, is, it's, it is undoubtedly um, a challenge, undoubtedly a challenge. Um, school and education for the foreseeable future isn't going to be um, what we normally what we normally see what we normally have and what we normally and what, well what we believe in um, but we will do our best and that's all we can ask for um, for, for our children um, and we will make sure we will make sure that um, they come into the school and they feel safe and they feel secure um, and they come back into a calm consistent um, environment um, and we do our very best with them in in the weeks that we have before the summer and beyond um, so yeah so courage um, we need lots of courage lots of courage lots of um, lots of self-belief in what we're doing um, working together working as a team um, and uh, just trying our very best in what are very very challenging circumstances so thank you very much for thinking of us um, and we continue to do what's right for our community um, and being the, the centre of, um, of what's important. So thank you very much. Having listened to the head teacher, here I am outside the Nayland Community School and you know my thoughts turn to Mark 10 uh, where it says uh, people were bringing the little children to Jesus to have him touch them but the disciples rebuked them. But then Jesus later took the children in his arms, put his hands on them and blessed them. Lord, we pray for this difficult time when the schools go back on the 29th of June. Uh, we pray that the parents, uh, as they need to uh, muster up the courage to allow their little loved ones to go back and the teachers themselves to muster up their own courage and self-belief to, to fulfill their teaching role uh, within the constraints and limitations of social distancing and the lack of touch and lack of hugs. Lord, we just pray that you would oversee and bless these little children in the same way you did in those days near Jerusalem, that you would also supply that courage that is so needed and provide that security and emotional well-being for the children, parents and teachers. Lord, particularly for the Nayland Community School, uh, for those children as they walk through these doors uh, after many weeks, Lord, we pray for some who may be fearful of what this virus may do to them and their families, pray that they would have an awareness of you being in control. Lord, we pray you would enable them to rekindle their friendships quickly and feel secure and enjoy their time, even though it will be so different. Lord, we pray also for wisdom and guidance and direction for the decision makers, those in authority, that the right decisions would be made, that they wouldn't be in a rush just to please the political pressures of the moment, but the right decisions would be made at the right time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray also for the Church in Wales schools, for John Cecil and his team as they advise the schools. Lord, we, we know you gave wisdom in abundance to young Solomon when he asked, and so we ask for similar wisdom in abundance for John and those working with the planning and for opening the church schools. Wisdom on how to practically enable the teaching to be both safe and effective, and the children would feel secure. So Lord, we bring all these children to you, some we know, some we don't, but you know them all, and we thank you that you promise to put, uh, to put them um, with your hands on them and bless them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Jim and Dawn, for those prayers. And I'm just going to say the collects now and uh, a final blessing. But thank you for joining us for worship. And we'll have another online service next week. But if you'd like to join us live on Zoom on Sunday, uh, just contact me through the website or through the Facebook page that we've got. Just before today's collect, we pray too for those who are going to be ordained. There were 18 people anticipating a service in the cathedral on Saturday, which can't, of course, ha happen. So we pray for each one of them. Disappointment and change in plans, it's never easy. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and equip them for the ministry that they are engaged with and that you are calling them to. We pray for the three who will be ordained in a very simple service, for Lorna Bradley, Hylwen Evans, and Jordan John Spencer. And our collect for this week. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your heart and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and those whom you love and those whom you should love this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>